We, together, are experiencing a constant technological revolution. And perhaps what is most impressive about this revolution is we now try and put ourselves into the machine. This is artificial intelligence. The ability of a machine to think or act in a human-like manner, to use intelligence. And I know, when I first became interested in artificial intelligence, I thought it was just computer science. Then, about 10 minutes of looking into it, I realized there was other stuff. There was maths, um, data science, and way more. And about an hour later, I just realized it was a real mix of everything. There was a real academic integration. So let's start from the top. Most computers can be basically boiled down to ones and zeros. This is on or off. Now, this is very similar to something you own, your brain. The neurons in your brain communicate through millivolts of electrical energy. The one now means active, and the zero now means inactive. And it's this communication that leads to your conscious experience. Much like how in a computer, the interaction between circuits lead to what you see on the screen. So we've already delved into biology and psychology here, so let's go a bit deeper. In biology, they've managed to make a computational model of the sea slug. That has about 300 neurons, and it is an impressive finding. However, the human brain has 280 million times this number of neurons. And this brings us to our first issue, the complexity problem. Now, how can we solve this? Well, this is where biology and psychology really come into play. Because as we find new things, as we do more research, we understand ourselves more, and we can understand how to put ourselves into the machine more and improve AI. Biology opens up more doors beyond this. Perhaps imagine that you have another organism that you want to put that feature into a machine. I'm just speculating the chameleon here. The chameleon has the ability to recognize and adapt to its environment. Perhaps you could make a machine which had visual recognition AI, and it could see its environment and understand it, and in relation to that, like the chameleon, adapt. And this isn't just a one-way street between biology and AI. AI is helping push forward the field of biology because it's able to find trends in data, in DNA and genes, and more, that before just couldn't be discovered. Now, what about psychology? Well, in 1963, the field of artificial psychology was born. And this looks specifically at how we can put the individual into the machine. And we're very right to do so. We're incredible. Because we're able to learn, we're able to work off past experience. These are features we want in machines, to make them better, to make them more useful. Now, even more social areas of psychology can look at making friendly user interfaces with the machine. What really wraps up what I've said so far is neural networks. Neural networks are commonly used in data science, but they take huge amounts of inspiration from biology and psychology. Neural networks are built from nodes. Now, these nodes are very similar to the neurons in your brain. A node will be connected to another node, and when active, will receive a response. And if that response is good, then the node becomes stronger. It's listened to more. Much like if you do something, you get a response. If it's a positive response, the neurons in your brain, the connections between them become stronger. Now, if a neural network is made correctly, at first, it should appear rather random, and then slowly, it learns and becomes better and better at the task it's been dedicated. However, this is much like how if I tried to learn to juggle. At first, I'd be un uncoordinated. I'd drop the balls, they'd go everywhere. And slowly, my brain would talk to my hands, I'd, my coordination would become better, and I'd learn. I'd learn how to do it. OK, so now for the more abstract influences on your life. Politics philosophy, and theology have a huge amount more to do with AI than you may think. Beginning with politics, politics can help control AI. And more importantly, it helps us adapt to it. In Sweden, they have a subsidy in place. 
And this subsidy aims to cover the costs and help families with dealing with the replacement of machines in the workplace. And AI will further this. But perhaps what a more impressive adaption is that its Scandinavian neighbor, Finland. In Finland, 1% of the non comp sci population has been enrolled in AI courses. This isn't so much to help develop AI technology. No, this is rather so they can make informed decisions about AI on the country's future. And these forms of adaption using politics goes hand in hand with the fluent functioning of our society. Now, religion is a subgroup of the society. And theology is a study of God and religion. And there's theological as well as sociological debate saying that perhaps AI goes against the norms and traditions. It threatens those traditions in religion, and this could cause backlash. I really don't see this as being the case. This is a Japanese Buddhist robot. It took me a bit when I first saw it, but then it started to make more sense because this robot is being accepted by Buddhist communities in Japan, and it's, allowed to, it's able to perform religious ceremonies at $1,700 US dollars less than a normal practice, and it makes it more accessible to the public, to believers. And there's other examples in other religions as well. For example, in Christianity, they've made confessions apps. This may mean if you're in a rural location or you just have a problem with talking to people, you can still practice your religion, your beliefs. Philosophy is kind of a grand overseer to many subjects, but when it comes to AI, it's far more integrated. Because the philosopher Chomsky said that just as the brain is functional, it therefore must be replicable. Now, other philosophers, philosophers debate that, yes, okay, it might be replicable, but we may not have the technology to replicate it. And beyond this, they debate the functions and definitions of AI. They see AI as a rational agent. And a rational agent is something that, yeah, perhaps it can make the best decision, the most rational decision in its own mind, but maybe this is not the most moral decision. And as a result, what are the ethics in place? What limitations should we place on AI? Should we leave someone's life in the hand of this? Well, we're already doing this. In Beijing, they have a rating system. Now, this is for people in a vegetative state and works off their brain scans. And if the rating is too low, unfortunately, the family have to have the choice whether they pull the plug on the patient. And a group of doctors gave these patients, two patients, a score of six and seven. However, they were handed over to an amazing piece of technology that could use visual recognition to rescan the brains and pick up on patterns that weren't usually susceptible to the naked human eye. We can't perceive them. And it re-rated these patients. It re-rated them as 21 and 23. And what's incredible is within six months, the first patient woke up. And within one year, the second patient woke up. And this is incredible, because it potentially it saved lives. It's saving lives here. And how was this possible? Well, politics was required to implement this into the hospital. Engineers and computer scientists were required to make this incredible piece of technology. Both of them working off a conjuring of the mind developed by psychology, bi biology, and chemistry, and more. Maybe there is some bad stuff. I won't know when I was looking up bad stuff to do with AI, I came across some um, pretty radical conspiracy theories. But there's certainly room for some concern. War. War is very deep on the political spectrum. And there's currently an AI arms race. War can be used to fear monger and win votes. And is it right that we create a technology if we use AI to assist in taking a life? You have to decide that for yourself. I'm not going to give you an answer to that. But what I am going to say is, would it be right if we made a technology that could perhaps identify, use AI to identify innocent civilians in a war-torn area and help them, assist them, maybe get supplies out to them. Because that's what this is all about. It's about what we do, the decisions we make. 
a politician can choose to fund the medical research or fund a war. An engineer can choose to make a constructive or destructive technology. All of these working off many researchers that have done the research that they've chosen to do. Now, finally, I'm not saying you should get involved in AI. I'm just saying whatever your background is, wherever you're from, whatever you do, you can get involved. And now it's easier than ever before. Because online, there's just a plethora of completely free resources. Even Stanford offers a free machine learning course online. And perhaps there is limitations on this technology. A lot of people talk about making this sentient machine. And I don't know if that's possible. But what I can tell you is by working together, by combining our efforts, skills and knowledge, and using academic integration, this limitation is a lot harder to comprehend. Thank you.